And Father, we sang, hear our praises, and now we say, hear our prayers. For you are good all the time, and we bless you. Now come, speak to us as we spend a few minutes in your word, just reflecting on what we've been learning this week out of our walks and out of our studies in Scripture. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, after 26 years, we are now the proud owners of 7244 Arcola. <laughs> and we are going to celebrate that a little bit later in a couple of different ways. You know how weird we are here. We always do things a little silly or a little strange. But we're going to go outside and we're going to gather around the property and we're just going to thank God for it at some point. Um, that came from Jim. Jim, tell us. You're going to have to stand and you're going to have to shout. So people on Zoom, because I don't think this cord will reach that far. Okay. Yeah, that would be great. Come on up, Jim. Marion's going to bring you up here. That's awesome. That way people on Zoom can see you as well. Put your hand on the desk down, perfect. You can you, I'll hold the mic. <laughs> All right. I think it was in July, Cam sent an email, his daily email about um, what to pray for in Magin Edmonds. And in that message, he mentioned about spiritual attack and that we should be praying around Ephesians 6. And if I... So I was contemplating that. Pictures came to my mind, and if I remember correctly from high school, a Roman squad was consisted of 100 soldiers, and they marched in rows of 10 by 10, with the 10 in the back with their shields linked together to protect them from the back, along the sides, shields linked together, and in the front. So they were protected all around, and the only way the enemy would have to fire ar arrows into the center, because <laughs> they were safe around the sides. So I got thinking that as God's people, that we should do that around uh, the Imagine Edmonds property, which are shields of faith li linked together or swords of the spirit, sword of the spirit lifted high in battle formation. And Cam mentioned about uh, doing that and circling <laughs> uh, the prop, uh, imagine at in sight. I don't think we have enough people to do that. And we're, it, we're pretty close, we'll do okay. Yeah, but I got, when you mentioned that, it got to think about Gideon. 300, 300 men, three groups, in three different sites. So I thought uh, 300 or a bunch in front of ETC, a bunch in front of Arcola, and a bunch in the uh, Royal, between the Royal Bank and the other property, holding our hands up high, our hand up high. The sword of the Lord for Imagine Edmonds. That was even better than I remember, Jim. That's wonderful. We're going to go out and we're going to celebrate that a little bit later, all right? Well, come with me. I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes kicking us off, and then I'm going to get you talking around tables a little bit. You know that uh, this is the final week that we're together around Backyard Pilgrim. Every summer we choose a book, work through it together, and the reason that we chose Backyard Pilgrim was just this desire to be on the on our toes again, on the front foot, ready to get into our neighborhoods as God has called. So we've walked We've discerned, we've looked for God's presence, we've looked for him at work. We've been reminded about God's speed, that sometimes we go too fast and we run ahead of God. And then yesterday, Jonathan and I had breakfast and he reminded me, sometimes we don't see God because we think he's so far away and yet he's actually right here so close. And we miss him because it's so simple. Well, chapter 6 in your book, if you've been keeping up, is usually done during Lent and during passion week but here we are towards the end of august but it means just the same so let me begin this talk a little bit today by 
starting with a question. The question is, what is the problem that we face in life? The answer, life is full of difficulties. You know that. You experience it. Don't have to show your hands. You don't have to tell stories. But I would imagine almost every single one of us has faced financial difficulties over the last little while. Inflation going crazy, interest rates skyrocketing, people losing their jobs. There's all kinds of different financial difficulties that we faced. Or relational difficulties. Maybe because of some of the other difficulties. Things are tense at work, at home, in the neighborhood. Circumstantial, all kinds of different things. Health difficulties. We prayed for Nicole a little bit earlier. I was down in Palm Springs this week. You're right. Why in the world would anybody go to Palm Springs in August? It was 43 degrees. As I was coming home, I um, came up to the ticket counter. You know, I've been caught a number of times in travels where you get your boarding pass on your phone, and then somehow the internet doesn't work or something doesn't function properly, and then you're stuck. So I've just made a habit recently of going and getting an actual proper boarding pass. It's probably my issue, but all right. So I go up to the counter and get a boarding pass, and this couple comes sort of hustling back, and they're like, did we leave our passports here at the boarding count at, at the ticket counter? And they did. And the lady says, you did. This must have given you a heart attack. Well, little, little did she know that when we boarded the plane about an hour later, five minutes from takeoff, the man had a heart attack. And the stewardess comes running down, y you know, you've probably seen it in movies or maybe you've seen it in one of your flights, crying out for anybody a doctor, anybody a nurse, anybody a medic. And two big guys fairly close to me got up and they went up to about row eight or somewhere. And you could see that everybody sort of hunched over this guy that slumped in his seat. And they couldn't really get at him, so they grabbed him, they pulled him out, and they sort of firemen carried him off the plane. And the tension on the plane was just, it was high. Everybody's waiting and waiting and waiting. And about 15 minutes later, his wife came back onto the plane and started to gather stuff. The pilot came onto the intercom and said, ladies and gentlemen, we, we have a pulse in our gentlemen again. And the cheering that went on on the plane the tears that were coming from the stewardesses and from other people. Friends, it was, it was an incredible experience. I don't know if you've ever been in something like that, but we sat there for another hour and a half, and all kinds of people were missing connecting flights. And nobody cared. Because this man had f had this difficulty and now was being taken to the hospital. We have these difficulties at times in life. And all these things, whether it's circumstantial, financial, relational, health, whatever the issue might be, are real and legitimate and they hurt, and, but they're, they're all about making life better. This week, as we dove into Backyard Pilgrim, it wasn't that we rejected those things or turned away from those things, but we wanted to pay attention to actually the real difficulty in life is being recreated, reborn redeemed or, or, or said differently moving from the kingdom of this world where we want life to be difficulty free to a life in Christ where we recognize his presence in the midst of difficulties and that we expect difficulties to happen because we're on mission with him one of the reasons I was down in Palm Springs it was not a holiday it was a pastor's retreat, and I got to hang out with a whole bunch of pastors that have been friends for a long time. And um, one of the ladies there started telling a story of a kid in their church, high school student, that she had been going through some really difficult times. But she'd been going through difficult times. Why? Because she says it's so hard to declare that I'm a Christian in, in my school. Lots of you guys that are in high school, you know the same is true here in Canada. Because as soon as you say you're a Christian, people label you with all kinds of things, and you're anti this and anti that and against all kinds of things, and the persecution is so much different than when I went to high school. 
But friends, Jesus faced difficulties too. And Matt draws our attention in the book this week to the time that he was in the garden, crying out to the Father. Oh, Father, take this away, this difficulty that I'm facing. Take it away. See, there's nothing wrong with coming to God and saying, I'm facing something that's just overwhelming. I need your help. Even take it away. But look at the second part of Jesus' prayer. But if this furthers your kingdom, give me the strength to go through with it. Use it for your glory's sake. See, Jesus knows our difficulties. And when we recognize the difficulties of being on mission with him, he not only knows them, he's been through them and is able to meet us in our difficulties. For when we face these kinds of difficulties, they're actually the greatest chance to be close to Jesus. Why do we have these difficulties? Paul says it in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. What's, what's Paul say? He says difficulties come because three reasons. One, the cravings of the flesh. It's our fault. We choose. We choose to walk opposite to what God's asked us. That's the first reason. The second reason is the ways of the world. There's a culture around us that has got caught up in living in the kingdom of the world versus the kingdom of God. And so there's all kinds of different ways of getting at something. And sometimes just being around that, we can't help but get caught up in that. You can think of lots of examples. But sometimes there's spiritual battles too. Jim referenced that a minute ago. So it's the cravings of the flesh, the ways of the world, and the spiritual battles, for Satan is at work. And I believe that in the last few months, whether it's West Kelowna, whether it's uh, the Arcola uh, property, the Imagine Edmonds stuff, all kinds of reasons we're facing spiritual battles, and we need to pay attention. So what do we say? What do we say when we pray to God? Take it away? For sure, he listens. Lord, this is tough. But we need to pray the same as what Jesus prayed. If this is necessary or useful for your kingdom, give me the strength to endure it. Help me through it so your name becomes glorified. Friends, take a couple minutes at your table. What are some of the difficulties that you're facing right now? And even take a minute or two and pray for each other in the midst of it. All right? Let's just take five minutes out around the tables, then I'll come back. All right, so come on back. Thank you for doing that. Let me do just a few more minutes before we sing in response and go outside for a few minutes. What is the problem we face? Life is full of difficulties, but the issue is that we so often try to fix it on our own. We get into relational issues and we want to get vengeance when there's been something done that's harmed us. We blame someone else. Or the circumstances go against us. And what do we do? We roll up our sleeves and we work harder. If I just did more. You get the idea. We go down a whole list of things and it's always done in our agency rather than in learning to trust God. I remembered a video that uh, has been so helpful to me in the past. You've probably seen it, but let's have a quick peek at it, and then we'll uh, see if it stirs up something in us. I just don't trust you. You don't trust me? No, I mean, I want to trust you. I just don't. <laughs> I have an exercise that I think will really help. Oh, okay. Stand here and face this direction. Mm -hmm. Now, do you trust me? Uh, no, I just said I don't trust you. Well, this is all part of the exercise. Oh, all right. Okay. Whenever I ask you if you trust me, you say, yes, Jesus, 
I trust you. Even though I don't. It's practice. Okay. So, do you trust me? <laughs> yes, Jesus. I trust you. Now, fall back. Are you going to catch me? Don't worry about that. Part. Okay, that's the part I'm worried about. <laughs> you can do this, okay? Just trust me. Trust you. Fall back. Okay, well, Jesus, I trust Good. you. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, let's try this again. Just face this direction and keep your feet planted. All right? Do you trust me? Yes, Jesus, I trust you. Now, fall back. Okay. I'm going to do it. All right. I'm really going to do it. <laughs> okay. Good. Ah! Oh, Jesus, you really got me. I didn't think you were going to catch me, but you did. Oh, that was great. <laughs> You're ready for level two. Level two, here yes. I come, baby. Woo! Oh. Woo. Okay, hold it. Oh, <laughs> you know what? You're too close. You need to move back. <laughs> ah, right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> this one's a little bit different. Though. Oh, okay. Uh, stand here. Uh huh. But face me. Oh, forward fall. Okay. I can do that. Wait. Whoa. <laughs> okay. Um, wait for my signal. Oh, right, the Jesus signal. <laughs> yes, the okay. Jesus signal. Do you trust me? Yes, Jesus, I trust you so much. Good. Fall back. Awesome. It is awesome, <laughs> especially when you do it. <laughs> Seriously? Of course. Okay, Jesus, I don't know if you noticed this, but there is nobody over there. I know it looks that way to you. It looks that way. It is that way. You can do this, Laura. Just trust me and fall back. <laughs> Jesus, I can't do that. We can do it together. I can't. You can. I won't. It's close to home. Matt does such an excellent job in the last couple of days of week six, talking about a process by which we learn to trust God. Let me give you three things that he talks about. First, he says, you have to remember Jesus demonstrates what trust in the Father is all about. He demonstrates by showing us that we start with forgiveness. Who are the people in your life that you've not forgiven? You know, so often we get caught up in this idea that, well, people have picked on me. They've blamed me for stuff that I didn't even do. And if anybody has a reason to be upset with that, Jesus did. Persecuted, accused falsely. And yet, even on the cross, what does he say? Father, forgive them. Wow. What did he want? more than his own comfort, more than his own situation, more than even having his difficulties dealt with. What did he want? He wanted those that were in opposition to him to come to know the Father. Father, forgive them so that they might be redeemed by you. More important to him was the relationship with his Father would have with even those that mistreated him. So who do we need to forgive? Are there those that you just struggle with? I know the answer. You don't have to answer out loud. That have hurt you. That the issue that you need to deal with inside of, inside is, can I come to a point where I'm actually wanting the redemption of that person more than I want vengeance. Second, he says, you need to face your fears. Facing fears is not about, I'm scared of spiders or snakes or the dark or tight spaces. Or, that, that's not what he's talking about. No, he's talking about living into our, our, our identity as children of the king. Jesus is on the cross, and what does one of the people in the crowd say? If you are the son of God, Doubt, fears. All through the life of Jesus, the Father is constantly reminding him of who he is. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. At his baptism and the temptations in the wilderness, at the transfiguration. Thirty years ago when we started Southside Community Church, 
one of the things the elders said is one of the most important things that we can teach people, that we can help people, that we can pray into their lives, is that we understand our identity is as children of the king. And our lives are lived under that banner, not under any other banner. Like we have to achieve something or look this way or accomplish that. can't help but wonder if one of the biggest fears that we have is that we're okay to the Father and that we're really His kids. Forgiveness, facing our fears of identity. Third one, this was the highlight of my week. We learn to sing the songs of God's people. Graham, I don't know if you were old enough or remember some of the trips we used to take as kids. Dad would play his music generally on an eight track or a cassette. I don't know if some of you even know what those are, but we'd be traveling across the country and there was one thing that because we'd lived in the States for a while and my dad had been around during some of the racial tensions in the U.S., back in the late 60s. We used to, he used to play a song called We Shall Overcome. It was a Negro spiritual that there was just this sense of uh, the black people being able to say, we will endure all that's coming against us because one day we will be delivered. And I remember it. It was so powerful. Well, come to the text. Psalm 22 that Shelley read for us earlier. It was one of the songs of the Jews when they were persecuted, when they were in the midst of all kinds of difficulties. What did they do? They actually had these psalms that were songs, and they began to sing them. And Matt draws attention this week to us. It's beautiful. Picture this. There's Jesus on the cross. Not only is he forgiving those who have put him there wrongly, but what does he say? Why have you forsaken me? Where is it from? Psalm 22. It's the first line. And Matt points out to us, don't miss this, that what Jesus very well could have been doing is starting the song, the song of God's people that brings deliverance. So Jesus starts. And what if that day people heard it and began to sing. Began to sing the rest of the psalm that was all about putting their trust in the Father. We sing. We sing not just because we want to feel good. No, we sing because we're declaring that there's a story that we're living into. One who deals with all of our difficulties. And even if he doesn't, he gives us the strength to endure so that his name is praised. Marion, let me call on you to come and lead us in a time of communion around our tables where we declare, we practice, we put into a dram dramatic form this whole story through communion.